So, good evening, everybody. Fantastic to see such a great crowd in this lecture theatre. I think there's hardly any spare seats, which is uh, really good news. So, my name is Professor Deborah Smith, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at the University. And it's my great pleasure this evening to welcome you all to this research in focus event, intriguingly entitled Let Us Play Artificial and Human Intelligence in Games. So, this series, the Research in Focus series, has been set up to showcase the variety and excellence of research at the university and its impact through talk and associated exhibitions. Straight after this talk, please do join us outside, collect a drink, and go and look at the supporting exhibition and what's on offer in our 360 immersive space. People will direct you if you don't know where to go. In the 2014 Research Excellence Framework across all of the UK universities, York was ranked in the top 10 UK institutions for research that has a positive impact. This great result is building on our existing reputation for research excellence, founded on our passion to make a difference in the world. Research excellence defines York, and further strengthening and improving our research to be dynamic, inspirational, and life-changing in its impact is an absolute priority for the university. Our vision is that York should provide a home for some of the best research in the world and be regarded as one of the best places worldwide to do research. To capture the scale of our ambition then, in January of this year, we launched our new university research strategy designed to support focused intellectual activity of the highest quality and encourage interdisciplinary research. Our research strategy has identified seven research themes to which we will align our academic strengths to best meet the grand scientific, social, and environmental challenges of our time. Tonight's talk is part of our <coughs> Technologies for the Future theme, which looks to develop novel technologies, processes, and materials with the potential to transform the economic, environmental, cultural and social landscape. Our presentation tonight specifically explores artificial and human intelligence in computer games, including the use of Monte Carlo approaches to develop better artificial intelligence, and the work done to investigate immersive and social experiences that players have while engaged in game playing. Digital games are socially, culturally, and economically important around the globe, increasingly more so than the film or music industries. With the UK industry valued at over three billion pounds, the UK government and the games industry have over 30 million pounds invested <coughs> currently for research into games and digital creativity led by the University of York. Professor Peter Cowling and Dr. Paul Cairns, our speakers for this evening, both work in the Department of Computer Science here at the University. The department was ranked seventh overall in the UK in the 2014 Research Excellence Framework and fifth in the UK for the impact of its research. Some of the research being undertaken, undertaken in games at York has very real societal and scientific impact and we will hear more about some of these projects this evening. Professor Cowling's research involves building computer systems to make decisions in games and resource optimization using tools from artificial intelligence and operational research. He also looks at how this, this decision-making can be used for real-world scheduling problems. Dr. Cairn's interests are in human-computer interactions, and his research looks particularly at immersion in video games and how it relates to human traits of attentiveness and absorption. He is also investigating the wider community experience of games, work that provides plenty for us all to think about this evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers, Professor Peter Cowling and Dr Paul Cairns. Wow, there's a lot of people here. Okay, um, so I'm Peter Cowling. Uh, and I'm Paul Cairns. <laughs> I'm the one without a tie. <laughs> Sorry, Mum. Um, 
So, uh, okay, we're not going to spend any time on this side. So let's start by saying games are fun. Yeah, I never would have believed when I came to work in the university system that one day somebody would say to me, you're the professor of games, aren't you? Okay, and I'm getting away and being paid for making games. Not for playing games, for making games. Um, so um, this is the dirty underwear drawer of our respective uh, games collections. This, this is my board game collection. That's there. Um, this is part of my video game collection. This is my iPad around the time that the Flappy Bird was around. And this is me about age eight when I started creating my first games on the mighty Commodore PET computer. And uh, <clears throat> I'm a bit younger than Peter, so I, I had the Dragon oh, yeah. 32. <laughs> I had a whole 24K more. <laughs> Okay, and games are important. Yeah, it's really important to recognise that. So economically, the games industry is bigger than the film industry, it's bigger than the DVD industry, and it's bigger than the music industry. The gross domestic product of the games industry is larger than the gross domestic product of the country Croatia. Yeah. <laughs> And al alongside that is that there's not really the fact that there's a huge amount of money uh, moving ar around around games. There's an awful lot of time being spent on games. 50% of the Western world plays games on a regular basis, and that's going across all generations. It's not just uh, sort of children uh, and, and teenagers, which is the, the stereotype. And so when people are, are playing games, they're doing a, a huge number of activities, and they're doing it over a long period. By the time these days, by the time a person reaches the age of 18, they will have been playing for around about 10,000 hours of digital games. And that, just to put out in perspective, that 10,000 hours is a magic number in, in lots of places because it's said to be the level at which you become, say, for instance, a virtuoso pianist. Okay, so by the time our children are growing up, they are becoming virtuoso digital gamers. But alongside that, the, the, the things that they're doing, they're learning about how games work, they're processing, they're picking up skills that they couldn't pick, in other, uh, pick up in other ways, but also the way they're solving problems and engaging with problems is actually helping to solve real-world problems as well in, in situations such as foldit.com, where people are solving problems in protein folding. So, um, games research at York has a number of dimensions, and we'll focus on two here tonight. Uh, the work of, of myself and my collaborators, uh, many of whom are here, uh, is on artificial intelligence for decision-making in games. And I'm going to look at uh, how humans interact with uh, games and the experiences that result as a, as a consequence of playing. We'll talk about games as a tool for achieving goals in science and society and games for things like therapy. And then we'll conclude by looking at some of the future directions of the games research here at York, talking about various projects, some in more or less detail, uh, before discussing about the games group that York's setting up. Okay. It's a good job we practiced. That worked really, really well. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> we should do it more often. Um, so let me start by talking about making decisions in games, so-called artificial intelligence. Um, now, artificial intelligence is in the press at the moment, yeah, and Hollywood loves to tell us how we're all going to die because robots are going to kill us. Um, well, this is maybe the slightly lighter side of artificial intelligence, which is making for more fun and playable experience within games. So, suppose you wanted to make a decision as to which move to make in a game. Well, one possible approach would be if you have these three moves, A, B, and C, you could consult some soothsayers who could tell you, well, if you make move A, the outcome is you lose. If you make move B, the outcome is you lose. If you make move C with this rather exotic soothsayer here, the outcome is that you win. And so you make move C leading to the win. So we don't have access to uh, uh, soothsayers, but we do have access to computational power. So we construct a thing called a game tree. And a game tree looks forward into the future of the game. So if we consider this, this simple game of OXO, then if we look forward into the future, eventually we get to positions which are win, wins or losses for one of the players. And then by going backwards from this, this forward look into the future, we can work out which of these moves is a win or a loss. 
And in fact, we find that these two moves lead to a draw if both players play perfectly, and this move leads to a loss. And so we choose either of those two best possible moves. Okay? And this is a thing called Minimax Search. It's been around for a very long time, and it's the engine that drives decision-making in many games. It works spectacularly well for chess. In 1997, IBM created the Deep Blue chess playing uh, software, and it beat the world chess champion, uh, Gary Kasparov. And Gary Kasparov threw his toys out of the pram in a really entertaining way. He was very annoyed to have been beaten by a computer uh, and didn't really believe that the computer hadn't been cheating. Um, on the same day that the Deep Blue computer beat Gary Kasparov, the, uh, the price, the value of IBM stock increased by half a billion dollars. Okay? The market thinks it's important to have good AI. This second one is more technical, but I think an even greater achievement, which is that the game of checkers, English drafts, is solved. Checkers is a draw. This is the largest uh, computational problem of its type that's ever been solved. And so uh, there is a perfect player for checkers, and that's one of the things illustrated in the exhibition. Um, but for some games, they seem harder to crack. Go is the, the Chinese or Japanese or Korean version of chess, much more popular than chess, um, much more widely played. Um, and the, Jonathan Schaefer, who um, created this, this perfect player for, for checkers, for drafts, made this comment. So he thought Go was too hard to crack in the immediate future. And then something happened. Oh, sorry. And then the thing that I forgot in the rehearsal, and I forgot it again here. Uh, and the reason that it's so difficult is because the number of Go positions is much bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. Yeah? So to search through all of the Go positions <coughs> is about as computationally hard as to search through all the atoms in the universe. Okay, so it's pretty tough. Okay, and you can see some people smiling at the way that I've glibly stepped over a few details there. Um, but now something happened. Monte Carlo algorithms are algorithms which flip coins or roll dice. Yeah, these are algorithms which use randomness in a very powerful way. And until about 2006, uh, 7, 8, uh, until uh, Monte Carlo algorithms were used to play Go, Go players were at this level of kind of an average or weak uh, human player. And now since 2008, the, the level has increased and increased until now Go playing decision makers, uh, computer decision makers for Go, are almost as strong as the strongest human players. And the key was rolling the dice, these Monte Carlo algorithms. So we, we have this, this idea, the multi-armed bandit. So the multi-armed bandit has this freaky octopus person which has a choice as to which arm to pull each time. And every time an arm is pulled, there's a different reward. Now, th this is a really important problem in things like pharmaceutical research, where each of these arms corresponds to a, 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 a molecule whose pharmacological properties are being tested. So, so this is a, a very important model in all sorts of areas. But here, each of these arms is a move in a game. And so we, we take that move, then we computationally look forward in time, and then we work out whether that move was good, and we repeat many, many times. So um, I, I, I've been warned before now that every time you put up a slide of maths, you lose about half the audience. Okay? So this is my maths slide. So sorry for the half of you who are going to want to leave after this. So you balance exploitation <clears throat> against exploration. So exploitation says, I want to make a move because it looks good. Yeah? I've done a few trials, and so far it looks good. Exploration says, I'm going to look at a move because I don't know enough about it. Yeah? It's about time I had another look at the move. And this, this relatively simple formula, well, I'm not sure if everybody would agree with that, but but this formula, in a very clever way, balances exploitation and exploration. And this is an area where we have, uh, we have a good deal of expertise. We know a lot about what to do with this formula. And some of the people in the audience uh, know a lot about this formula. Um, so what we do is 
we construct this, this game tree. So each of these blobs here is a position. And when we get to the bottom of the game tree, we add a new position. Then we run one of these random simulations to the end of the game and determine whether it's a win or a loss or a draw. And then we propagate this back up the tree. Okay? <clears throat> if I was given a slightly more technical talk, I'd show you the code for this now. And the code for this in Python is about 10 lines long, okay, with a few subroutines and details. Um, and then we repeat many times for a world championship level Go playing program millions of times per move. So the good thing about this is it's uh, asymmetric. So, uh, sorry, what does that mean? So it means that we balance this need to explore new, new moves against the need to, to exploit moves which look good. Um, we can stop it any time and it makes the best decision given the, the CPU, the amount of time that we've invested. Um, and the, the really smart part, and the, and the thing that's, that's got many people in the games industry excited about this, is all we need is the rules of the game. We need nothing other than the rules of the game, and then we can use this algorithm. Okay, demo. How am I doing for time? I don't know. Let me do the demo. Aha. Okay, so, uh, yes, okay, that didn't work at all. There we are. So, I'm going to run Monte Carlo Tree Search for the game of Connect 4, which has this nice property that at each stage I drop a counter down one of these files, and so when you see the game tree in a second, you can understand what things mean. Um, so, if I let the computer play first, then the computer... Um, and I put it on hard level, so you can now watch me be beaten by the computer at Connect 4, because I don't think I've ever beaten it at hard level. Um, okay, I thought I'd let it play first. But. And so uh, now what we see is the tree being constructed. Okay, so when we wrote this uh, software, it was constructed rather slowly. This computer is much more powerful than the software, the computer we wrote it on, so it's constructed rather quickly. And we see here, here are the seven possible moves in this game tree. And it believes that this move, which is very strongly highlighted, is by far the best move. Okay? And so if I just make a few more moves, and we'll see what happens. Yes, so, and the computer believes that this move is very strongly the best move. Okay? And I'll keep on going. Let me make some rather bad moves, otherwise you're going to get bored. Um, uh, it's not hard for me to make bad moves. Okay? At this stage, the computer's probably thinks that it's, it's beat me, yeah? But let's, uh, let's give it another um, chance to really slaughter me, okay? And now that this thing's gone green, it thinks it's won. And whatever I do, it's going to beat me. Okay, so, okay, so, and it beat me. Um, and you see at the end here that, in fact, it had two different moves that won, and then it's, it's choosing the move that, that, that wins. So it's asymmetrically building the interesting parts of the future. Yes, yeah? so, so that's, that's quite important to the algorithm. Okay, one of these days I'm going to beat that computer in front of an audience, but I've never done it yet. Um, okay, so the other thing that we're particularly good at, and the, and the thing that we've done with this algorithm, is uh, to manage uh, imperfect information. If we, play, if we play a game of poker, then I, I can see my cards, but you can't see my cards, and I can't see your cards. So there's this, this asymmetry between the information that we can see. So um, in, in a game like StarCraft II, which is one of my favorite video games, this is simulated by the fog of war. So these two marines, let's suppose that these are uh, controlled by an artificial intelligence, by a computer player. then this is what they can see, yeah? Not much. They can see this area here, and then there's this big fog over here, and they don't really know what's in there. So when dealing with uh, the fog of war, or when dealing with the fact that the two players can't see the same things, um, an obvious thing to do is cheat, yeah? Just look at the player's cards, or look into the dark area and see what's actually there, yeah? So we can simply cheat and see what's there. Um, and this is surprisingly effective, especially if you pretend not to cheat when it's too obvious. Yeah? 
but it's not a very satisfying experience. Yeah, there's, the, there's genuine asymmetry. The two players are playing different games. Yeah, you're playing a game with this hidden information. The computer's playing a game where it can see everything. And, and so you have no incentive to either hide information or gather information. And if you think about a game like poker, yeah, poker without hiding or gathering information is barely a game at all. Um, a second idea is we can guess, okay? We don't cheat, but we guess that there's some badasses out there in the darkness, and then we pretend, well, we work out what we would do if our guess were right. And the third idea, which is the idea uh, which is, is the innovation that, that really we brought to this, is to average over many guesses in a, in a particular sort of way. And in this case, I, I'm going to demonstrate this using a simple card game. Suppose I hold three cards and my opponent holds three hidden cards. Um, then I can use a thing called Information Set Monte Carlo Tree Search, um, some of the inventors of which are, are here in the audience. Um, and uh, if I choose a set of cards for my opponent, then only part of the futures is available. Specifically, the futures where my opponent holds ace, jack, nine are the only futures which are available. And if I choose a different set, then a different set of futures are available. Now, there are two innovations here that I don't have time to go into in any detail at all. But each of these triangles contains many, many, many positions, millions or possibly trillions of positions for some games. Um, and we collect information in these very large collections of possibility space. Yeah? And these are what the information sets are in the, in the name. Um, and the second one is that we, uh, we repeat and collect statistics in, in a rather clever way that I'm not going to talk about at all. Um, but there are lots of successes. For many games, this produces somewhere between highly plausible play and best ever play. Yeah, by an artificial player, by a computer player. Um, one particular example is AI Factory Spades. Um, and we've done lots of work with Jeff Olson at AI Factory. Um, and uh, I think this is a particular success. Um, so in this case, uh, Spades is a, a, a card game rather similar to, to Bridge in some ways, a partnership-based card game. And when we created an artificial player for this, it was stronger than the existing artificial player, yeah, by some way. So we created a stronger player, but it wasn't always fun to play. Um, and the reason is this. When your AI player can see that it's won, it doesn't really matter what it does then. It can do whatever it likes, and it's still going to win. So the human perception of that is very often that when it wins, it starts taking the mickey out of the opponent. Yeah? It's rubbing it in. I've won, so now I'm going to make ridiculous moves. And conversely, when it can see that it's lost, the computer can see that it's lost, but you can't, then it starts making ridiculous moves again, because it doesn't matter what it does. It's still going to lose. So it looks kind of sulky. <laughs> so what we did in this case is we combined the, uh, the, the Monte Carlo tree search, the, the search-based AI, with the knowledge-based AI in, in a particular, uh, particular and clever way. And the result is a player that's, that's the, the same sort of strength, indeed maybe a little stronger, um, but plays a much more fun game. Because when it has a choice between things, you go back to the, the reasonableness test and say, is this a kind of sulky move? And if it says yes, you say, oh, no, I'll, I'll take a different move then. Um, and the scientific, there's a new scientific frontier. Yeah, and this is something which we're pioneering here in York. We can get the data now, in principle, for, for the 2.5 million players that are playing with our artificial intelligence. So this is, this is just a, a new game, if you'll forgive the, the, the way of phrasing that. And so now we can do field trials with 2.5 million participants. Um, and what you can see on this slide is that um, in the green are... Uh, this is where players are, are beating the computer opponent. In the orange is where players are evenly matched with the computer opponent. And in the red is where the computer opponent is beating the players. And generally what you can see here is people like to win. Yeah, they want to beat their computer opponents. The other thing that this allows us to do is to understand human behavior and preference on a, on a large scale. An, an unprecedented scale, really. 
Um, and so here is an example where we've, we've constructed a particular model, I think called a decision tree model, um, which allows us to analyze the, the, the behavior within this game of millions of players. So, of course, it's <clears throat> the whole point of playing these games is to actually to, for the experience that games provide the players. So, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the idea of gaming experience. The idea, what happens when, to a player when they're actually playing a game. It comes under various different names. It's play, gaming experience, GX, or player experience is another name for it, PX. Um, but this all comes under a wider umbrella, which within my old field, field of human-computer interaction, of user experience. Whenever we react with interactive systems, uh, we have some sort of experience. And games, if you like, distill that down to the pure, purest experience that we can have, because that's what they're all about. So, but when it comes to playing games, surely it's not that complicated. Really, it's not that complicated. I mean, why, you know, just ask the players what they think. You don't need a guy in a suit and grey hair to tell gamers what they think, yeah? Well, it's more complicated than that. So, there's different types of experience you can get from a game, for instance. So, obviously, games are about fun. Okay? I think people will generally go, oh yeah, games are all about fun. Well, it's not as simple as that. There are games doing all sorts of interesting things. The Last of Us is a game about a, a small girl surviving the apocalypse. I don't think fun's quite, quite the right word that goes along with that sort of game. And similarly, enjoyment. Well, yes, we enjoy games, but enjoyment, really? I'm not quite sure that's quite right for that sort of game. And, there are, and that's not the only sort of game that's trying to push the boundaries of the experiences that you can have. Games are engaging. We get involved with them. We have some sort of engagement with the game. Um, and that, that seems like a reasonable thing to think about. But games are presumably more than that. My own work, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, is immersion. I'm really interested in how people get into the game and what that experience is like, what's happening when you're really engrossed in it. And at the extreme end of that, psychologists have the idea of the notion of flow, which is some sort of optimal experience, which happens when everything's just coming together to provide that perfect playing experience. It's analogous to the sportsman being in the zone. So when everything's just coming together and it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. So these are the types of experiences we can talk about. We can also talk about these sorts of experiences. Presence, the sense of being in a virtual world, being transported into a world we couldn't otherwise imagine. Autonomy, the sense of having control over our actions uh, and, and uh, choosing what it is that we want to do, something that we don't always have in real life, for instance. Or we feel competence, we're really capable because we've got, we've got this big gun, okay, um, for instance. Um, however, some, uh, some games, actually, in fact, all games are pretty frustrating, and that's also why we play them. We kind of revel in that failure, but then get back on the bike and try again. We're frustrated, but we're not daunted. And then some people say, no, no, it's nothing to do with that. It's all about story. No, it's all about story. People play games for the stories that the games provide. No, they play for the play, or the sense of incorporation, or the freedom, or the fa and so on. Okay? It all goes, there's all these different experiences, and this is where the challenge comes of understanding gaming experience. Because, of course, games encompass all of human experience. And we know this because this is why we play. And you look at anybody who's watched children playing. They, they do all sorts. They try to encompass all of their experiences and make sense of them through play, through playing formal games or informal games. They'll play at doctors and nurses. They'll play at teachers. They'll play at mums and dads. But they also play at, you know, the astronaut who fights the space dragon with a laser sword. OK? They're, they're just trying to make sense of all these different things that could happen and make sense of life that way. And as adults, we like to think we're more sophisticated. But judging by how off we play games, I'm not sure that's really that different. OK? We just dress it up better. So when it comes to understanding the gaming experience, there's a mismatch. OK? Of course, players know what they are experiencing. Right? That's inside the head. But there's what's happening to them in here. And then there's what they can say about what's happening to them. Some of these things we can't really articulate, and that's true of all sorts of experiences, when you watch a great film or read a good novel or play a good game. There are things happening that we can't necessarily talk about. So what players say about their experiences aren't the whole story. And then when they say things to somebody like me, I don't necessarily know what they mean. I may, they may say, oh, I've got a real sense of freedom, and I may think, ah, oh, I've read that in my literature, freedom means this. But of course, I may be using the word in some highly different way from the sense in which the player themselves mean freedom. So we've got to think a bit harder when it comes to understanding the experiences that games provide players. So for my own focus, obviously there's a huge variety of things we can think about. For my own focus, I'm interested in the sense of immersion. This is the sense of being in the game. Now, I don't mean the sense of being in a virtual world. Obviously, lots of uh, games provide a virtual world. They find a, a scene for you to run around with your, your big gun. Uh, or 
um, places to explore and find new things and uh, try out a fantasy role or whatever, okay? I'm not talking about that. I say that games, all games offer the opportunity to become immersed, to get involved and get into the game and start to lose a sense of the world around you as you move into the game. And also, clearly, from the work of Charlene Jennett and her PhD, it's not just paying attention. It's clear that it's something to do with the feedback that comes back from the game as a result of the actions you take in the game. It's not just simply dedicated attention. Immersion is, is a deeper feeling when things are starting to come together about what you're thinking about and what's happening in the virtual world that you're inhabiting. So let's, how does immersion play out in, in real-world games? So, so here's a real-world game. This is Dota 2, a very popular game at the moment. It's an online game, and it's basically you've got two teams of five fight against each other to try and win territory, essentially, the win towers or, or capture flags, okay? So as you can, actually, as I was gonna say, as you can see, I, I have no idea what's going on in this game, okay? <laughs> it, it's, it's lights and it's beeping and flashing, I don't know, okay? Um, but those who play it say it's great and they can make sense of what this scene might actually be like. But you can sort of see things going on, there's things shooting around, there's shields which are glowing, there's a tower in the middle which is sparkling. Um, and then along with that, we've got various information. There's chat happening here between the players, um, and there's sort of some sorts of displays which are telling you the status of the player, and there's a little map over there. So these are really, really complicated games, okay? All sorts of things are happening, all sorts of experiences can therefore ensue. So <clears throat> we need to kind of think, well, what, what can we learn about this? Where, where should we start? Well, of course, one of the key things is it's social play, okay? Dota is a social game. Um, people are playing together, and this isn't new. People always play together. They came together into arcades to play and gather around the Space Invaders or the Pac-Man and watch each other play. And people, when I was growing up, you'd get together with your friends and you'd play on the computer on your, your Dragon 32 or whatever, and, uh, and you'd be playing together and taking turns to, to lose. So, um, so, of course, the thing is social play is we got sort of more... Uh, interest in the last few years, particularly with the massively multiplayer online role-playing games, MMORPGs. Class typically World of Warcraft, which sort of hit the headlines, say 2005, 2006, is a really, really popular game. And it still is a really popular game. It has about 9.6 million active subscriptions. That's people who are regularly paying their bills for this service of, of playing the game and actually playing the game as well. But these things like uh, Dota and the other game League of Legends, LOL, they're even more popular. These are the latest statistics from uh, published in about January. Um, there are 27 million people playing League of Legends daily, okay? And at peak, it's 7.5 million people at the same time playing this game. These are colossal numbers of people playing. So clearly, social play is an incredibly important part of the digital, ex digital gaming experience. But how does that play out in terms of immersion? If I say people get into the game, when we play socially, so Peter and I might play uh, a game against each other, we could be playing socially, and as a result of having Peter as an opponent, I get more into the game, I'm more excited about, about winning that game and beating out, winning out against Peter, okay? And similarly, conversely, back at me. Or it may be the case that what's actually happening is that Peter, Peter and I are having a real-world experience for which the game is just uh, something that happens, okay? It's a way of having, interacting with a person in a real-world sense, and we're not into the game, we're into the fact that we're able to interact as social animals which we know humans like to do. So how does this play out? It could go either way. So let's have a think about what we might do to understand this better. We, when you ask players, so the easy way, you ask players what they say about it, they go, yeah, we would know, okay? They're very, very sensitive. So we, I talk about playing bots, okay? These are, well, I say AI, they're not really that intelligent often. They're just sort of something to play against. And some are sophisticated and some are, are not so sophisticated. But what they say is, Yes, if I played an AI, if I played a bot, I know the game would change. It wouldn't be the same game as playing somebody else. That would be much more fun. Okay? And there you go. Bots are stupid. I've never seen a useful bot. So they are universally confident that when they're playing uh, an AI or a bot, they would be able to identify it, and it wouldn't be the same game. Okay, so that's what they say about the experience. Let's have a think about it. We can't do experiments with the Dota. It's far too complicated, okay? There's so many different things going on, so many different variables that will come in and interfere with understanding what's going on. So let's pare it back down to a really simple game, which is Pong, okay? Yeah, you've got the tennis bats going. Uh, it's got a nice pedigree in the, in the history of digital games. Uh, and it's still perfectly playable and pass, passes a pleasant uh, half hour playing against a friend, okay? So let's think about the social play in the context of this quite simple game. So we have three conditions in an experiment, okay? So the three conditions are, 
you're playing the game. In the first condition, you're playing against an AI. Well, that's a lie. Okay, I'll come back, I'll come back to why that's a lie. We don't, we don't actually play an AI. You play another person in a, in a different room. In the, second com in the second condition, we tell the person, the player, that you're playing another person in the room, in a different room online. And in the third condition, we have the people sitting side by side. They're on separate computers playing the game online, but they're able to interact socially with each other. Okay? So what we do is we, we set up this situation and we measure immersion. Why don't we play a real AI? Because there's a possibility that the AI would play differently. Okay? So people, as, as Peter's discussed, that people are quite sensitive to the styles of play that you get. And if the AI were playing differently, um, people may say, oh, well, that's a different sort of play. That's not a person. And therefore, they, they second guess what's going on. So what we say is we make sure that it's definitely the, exactly the same playing experience by making sure it's another person that they play. Okay? So they're all playing each other. They're a player playing another person, um, but we tell them different things. So this is immersion up on the left-hand side of the scale, and these are the three conditions. This is the AI, that's not an AI. This is a person in another room, and this is a person in the same room. And how does that affect immersion? So what you can see is when people believe, very clearly what you see is when people believe they're playing an AI, they're less immersed. Okay? But of course this is not right, okay? because they're actually playing another person. So why are they less immersed? Because they're less involved in the social experience. The social experience brings them into the game, okay? And therefore, they get more immersed in it. And the fact that they, again, the fact that they said, oh, I definitely know it was a bot, well, they definitely didn't know it was a person, okay? So people don't really know what they are experiencing, and they, they believe what you tell them, okay? The other interesting thing to say out of this is that the difference in, in immersion between the two levels of playing online or playing uh, with somebody sitting in the same room beside you they're about the same. Even though the opportunity for social interaction is much richer, it doesn't matter in terms of the gameplay. You're in the game, you're brought together, and that's what counts. So online, that partly explains, I would imagine, why online play is so popular, because it provides the kinds of experiences you get playing with your friends in the same room. So let's think a bit hard about this. Suppose we had a really complicated game like Dota, and we wanted to provide some AI opponents that would be able to kind of get involved in the game and make the game a better game in some way. So the kind of thing that Peter's trying to look at, okay? So what we could do is one of the big things, one of the big movements in, in AI for games is the idea that we adapt the AI to the player. Because when the player's playing, if the AI is too hard, you lose too quickly, okay? But if it's too easy, you win too easily, and so there's no game. So you, there must be some sweet spot where the level of challenge is just right for the level of the skills of the player. And this taps again into that big psychological experience of flow. When you get that balance, you get this optimal experience, so the psychology says. So how would it work out if you had adaptive AI? Okay, so you have an adaptive AI in a game, and how does that play out in terms of getting into the game, the immersive experience? Well, again, could go either way. Yes, it makes for a better game. You have more, longer, prolonged play, better play. Or no, players want a real game. They don't want a game to be adapting to them. They want a severe beating from a game to know that it was worth doing. And, th and that's why games like Meat Boy, of just hideously cruel uh, difficulty, are popular. Okay? So it could go either way. How, how, how do we know? So we run another experiment. So this is uh, the game that we used to experiment. This is called Don't Starve. It's a survival game. Um, and there's your little character in the middle, and basically the character has to collect various resources from around the landscape uh, whilst avoiding the monsters, and then bed down for the night because that's when all the ghouls and, and beasties finally do come out and make a, a beeline for you. Okay? So you've got to get yourself organized, and then it goes into night, and you've got to survive, and then wake up the next morning and carry on. So just see survive how long you can. So this is a modern game. It's nice. It's, it's good. It's open source, so we could do what we liked to the game if we wanted to. So what do we do? This was done with uh, Elena Denisova, who's a, a PhD student of mine at the moment. Uh, and what she had people do was she got them to play the game twice. Okay? And in one condition, they played with adaptive AI, only we lied. Um, and in the other condition, they played without adaptive AI. So why are we lying this time? Well, partly because it's fun. Um, <laughs> um, and partly because, again, we're not quite sure how the different style of play would actually play out. So we just, say them, we just tell them, you're playing with adaptive AI, Oh, you're not playing with adaptive AI, and see how that influences the immersion, the actual experiences that they have. So once again, we're measuring immersion. What happens this time? So here you go. This is the measure of immersion up on the side, and again, where they're playing adaptive AI, they are more immersed in the game. 
But remember, there's no adaptive AI. Okay? It's what we told them. What we told them is making them more immersed in the game. What do they say about the adaptive AI that they had? So, of course, we go, we ask players, because, of course, that's a really easy way to find out about the playing experience. We ask players about the playing experience, and, of course, they, they start comparing the two different versions of the game that they played with, with adaption or without ad adaptation. Okay? And so what do they say? Well, one player said, well, it put me in a safer environment. The adaptive AI made it a, a longer game because they were they made it allowed to be safer and therefore last longer. Another player said, oh, it provided far more dangers. Okay? This is complete confabulation, okay? Nothing, nothing of the sort. The game's random each time, okay? This is the player seeing what they want to see. And so Elena and I call this the placebo effect. Just as in with medical uh, treatments, giving people pills makes them feel better, whether or not the pills do anything, okay? So in the same sense with games, we can change what, people's, people's ins, we can change what is in people's heads and their experiences that they therefore have just by telling them stuff, okay? Okay. Um, so you may think, well, this is just some nice academic exercise, but think again about things that are happening in the games industry. The games industry is awash with sequels, okay? Version 2, you know, a Tomb Raider's just been re-released after, I don't know how many, I played it years ago, okay? Um, and so on, there's, uh, we're up to Call of Duty 93 or something, I don't know. Um, so there's loads and loads of sequels, and of course what happens is every time a sequel comes along, the, the games manufacturer says, better game. And the players play the game, they go, it is. <laughs> okay, that's what's happening. They're getting that experience simply because they've been told. But also out there, there's hype and there's viral videos telling players what they should expect from this new experience. And then there's reviewers telling you what you should expect as well. So players don't walk into the game experience blank. They bring with them all of their baggage, all of their ideas, and all they've been told, uh, and it alters the experiences that they have. So that's why we do games experience research. Because it's just not that simple. It's really complicated. The games people are playing are extremely complicated, okay? People are complicated. They respond to all sorts of things like the placebo effect. They bring their baggage with them, their expectations, how they found the last version of the game, and so on. But then the world is complicated as well. The world is telling them what they should experience as well. This is a really great game, or this is much better than that other game, and they, have to, they don't know how to make sense of it, and they respond to it. So getting a clear insight into all of these things requires good science. Okay, it doesn't just happen. You've got to think very carefully about how to understand and separate all these different things from the really complex environments like Dota 2 and pair them out to get clarity on what actually really does make up the gaming experience. So I think we'll move now to talk a little bit about the future of uh, games research here at York. Are you clicking or am I? I don't know. I'll do. Right, I'll do. Oh, no. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> We didn't um, practice this bit. So we, uh, um, we, in order to present some of the things that are in the future of games research at York, we're going to present some of the projects which are going on here uh, at York at the moment. Um, and it's very pleasing to see many of the people involved in those projects in, in front of me here now. Um, so uh, the NEMOG project, NEMOG stands for New Economic Models uh, and opportunities for digital games. And NEMOG is about how do we extract this scientific and social value from this new phenomenon of games and gaming? So how can we use um, the, the data from millions of gamers, how can we mine that data in order to learn new things about the human condition? How can we use games as a tool for, for therapy? Um, and how can we uh, use it as a tool for, for science? Um, and NEMOG is quite hard-headed, as well as the, the, the scientists who are involved in the, the analysis of data and the, the analysis of games, um, quite a number of the people in the consortium are interested in the business models that underpin this. And so doing the research into how we can make the numbers work so that actually there's the funding available to, to do this sort of research. Another big project we've got going at, uh, here, well, being led out of York, is the, uh, the EPSRC Centre for Doctoral Training in Intelligent Games and Games Intelligence, IGI. Okay? What we've done here is we, uh, we're, we're look fortunate to have 55 scholarships funded by the EPSRC, uh, and thanks to that sort of thing, money starts coming to you as well from other sources, so we're 56 and we'll keep on Fantastic. getting as many as we can. And the idea is to bring people together uh, to, to get doctoral training 
from a, a large number of people in a co concerted effort to think about digital games. Okay? So we want to think about uh, not only how we can make better games through the AI, um, for instance, or through thinking hard about the game experience, but also to use those games for social good, for seeing generating data as a result of the massive amount of play that's happening all the time, and using that in some way to help get insights into, uh, well, more about games, but also about social good, healthcare, and so on. And so we've got uh, about uh, 60 uh, companies on board that are, or organizations that are interested in games who are joining us uh, in this endeavor, and our students will hopefully uh, engage with those extensively over the course of their, their PhDs. This is the current cohort of PhDs. There's, there's 12 of them. Uh, I just hasten to add, that's not actually a photograph. Um, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> They're, um, uh, and they're, they're, they're coming about nine months into their first year, um, and so they're engaging already with their, with their research and interesting things are already happening. And then this is the last minute edit, okay? I'm not allowed to show you this slide. Um, so this is the mysterious Project X, okay? Uh, we may have to kill you all uh, in order to... Uh, uh, we're not allowed to tell you about Project X, but we think we can tell you this much that there's another big project, which we will call for the moment Project X. About 20% of the people in this audience know Project X, um, but we're not allowed to tell you that we might have, we do have another very large project, uh, which is in the area specifically uh, in games at one end, but also in interactive media at the other end, and in the space where they converge, and very much looking at the new technical possibilities and challenges in that space and looking at how we can use um, games and interactive media to, to solve problems and to address opportunities uh, in science and society and education. Okay, I wish I could tell you more. So the other thing which we're launching here tonight is the York Games Research Group. And I've listed some of the stakeholders here, and I think many of those stakeholders are represented here uh, in the audience. So we're going to be working uh, very much externally with a variety of stakeholders, particularly with the games industry, but also with other organizations um, that can use games uh, in order to address some of these scientific, societal, uh, and, and therapeutic challenges. So here are some of our stakeholders. Uh, we will be having our inaugural uh, sort of uh, meeting uh, on Tuesday. So I hope to see some of you there will be there on Tuesday uh, in the ICSA seminar room. And so that, that's the sort of the, the start of the scientific grouping there. So <clears throat> in conclusion, the games industry is massive, okay? It's this huge uh, uh, money generating system, but it's also this huge data generating system, okay? People, play, people playing, people are playing a lot, they're getting a lot of pleasure out of their play, but they're also, wales, also able to exploit that and use the data that they're generating to solve real-world problems. And so we have this new tool uh, that we can use to do new science. Yeah, and and it's, it's the Wild West out there. We don't know exactly what we can do with this yet, but we do know that, for example, uh, the funding agencies have put a great deal of confidence in us in that we can address some of these challenges and we can get some value out of games in science and society. And that investment reflects the fact that they see the value for the, for the UK, for the UK games industry. We're not just trying to, uh, to, to go in, do our academic research and squirrel away on our own. The idea is to actually get our research out there through, for instance, the Iggy PhD students uh, and make a difference, make an impact, make more jobs, make better profits, obviously, for the companies, but also bring better profits to other organisations through the ability to exploit their data. So we've, we've quoted some numbers to demonstrate, this is working really well, this conversation stuff. Um, this, uh, we, so we, uh, I, I spoke it there, didn't I? Yeah. I cursed it. Sorry, I'll let um, you go, sorry. So, uh, um, so we've quoted some big numbers. And just one final thing to leave you with in terms of the importance of the games industry. Um, in the budget, just a few years back, and now this, this has uh, happened now, um, a tax break, significant tax breaks were given to the games industry. And so the, the Chancellor and the government recognised the importance of the games industry to the, the UK's economy and also its societal importance. So we want to, we're part of that, that growth and we want to work with the games industry and we'll work with people that can use games in order to exploit uh, some of the uh, opportunities that are out there and change people's lives.
Thank you.